Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is parapsychology in China. My guest is Simon Duan, who came from China to the United Kingdom to study in the 1980s, where he received a PhD degree in material science from Cambridge University. He is a past vice president of the Chinese Parapsychology Association. He is also founder and CEO of Metacomputics Labs, researching a post-materialist paradigm that unifies consciousness, mind, and matter, and has developed the hypothesis known as platonic computation. Simon is in the UK. In fact, he works for the UK government. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Simon. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you, Jeff, for having me.、Uh, it's a great channel. It's one of my favorite channels. So it's a great honor to be with you today. Well, I'm honored to be with you because, amongst other things, In our discussion today, you are a representative for the most populous country on Earth,、uh, a country that has a very long history in、uh, understanding and integrating the paranormal. And to my knowledge,、uh, most Westerners, even those with a deep interest in parapsychology, are. Unaware of what has been happening in China during your lifetime. Yes,、um, yes, there has been lots happening actually,、uh, particularly in eighties and nineties. And、uh, you, you also mentioned China has a history uh, of uh, lots of science. That is very true.、Um, if you look at the history books. Uh, lots of records of、uh, science and paranormals in all sorts of records. And、uh, there are also even the the, the inc-、uh, encryption engraving in a big stone, for example. Yeah, the story of、uh, how the site is is、uh, observed and discovered. So this is a full of sites、uh, in history in China, actually.、Uh, Yeah, one of the、uh, mountains、uh, is famous tourist mountain. If you have chance, you can go there. It's called the、uh, um, Lushan Mountain in Jiangxi Province. At the top of the mountain is a huge stone engraving、uh, commissioned by the emperor, the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty. It's it's a huge. It's four meters tall and、uh, nearly two meters wide. It's big stone and with pavilions. And on that engraving, it's a story of how a psychic helped the emperor、uh, to seize the power. Actually, <laughs> yeah, he was walking on the street, and one day a beggar, a crazy beggar, approached him. Says,、oh, "I can help you to seize the power to overturn the previous uh, uh, dynasty." And、uh, in order to test him, he actually. Locked him up in the room for many days without food and water. See whether it's true. And after that, he he built a big pot to put him into the pot to boil him. Yeah, <laughs> and see whether he survives. <laughs> Obviously, he survived, and、uh, he gave him a lot of advice, and even involved in some key battles to help him. And、uh, for example, to. Create a wind for his fleet, so that his fleet can arrive at the right time for key battle. And when the when the Mister Zhou was uh, uh, was ill, he sent some medicines to give him a lot of power, a lot of energy、uh, to to help him. So that's why、uh, he sort of、uh, made a big stone engraving, and、uh, it's this very nice story actually. So he would be a, a cultural hero in China today. 
<laughs> yes, that's fine. Yeah, but no, no one actually mentioned that. Uh, I never heard of this story until I went to the mountain to see the, the engraving in a big stone. Then I realized actually, oh, he was treated very special, and he, he disappeared after he seized the power, and emperor couldn't find him anymore. Well, now the Ming Dynasty. Do you, can you give me a a date for that in the Western calendar? When would that have occurred? Probably uh, five five hundred years ago. Relatively recently in in Chinese history. That's right, relatively recent. Yeah, but then there's all sorts of stories uh, with uh, psychic people and stories uh, how they. Uh, actually help people and uh, lots of healing story, of course, yeah, in Chinese medicine. And uh, the history of Chinese medicine also filled with Sai. If you look into the um, history of Chinese medicine, all the legendary famous medicine men in China are psychic people. Yeah, they can see through your body, they can see through your organ, like X-ray. And uh, they can even remove the tumor by, by psychic power. And even the herbal medicine is actually the property of herbal medicine was discovered by communicating with the plant uh, by psychic people. So that they know which uh, herbs have which properties. They classify the herbs into five different properties, like wood, water, fire, earth. And uh, uh, some of the properties can overcome the other property, and some enhance other property. So it depends whether they observed your body is lack certain elements. They can adjust the, the, the medication to help you. Yeah. So it is a, it's, it's a lot of science involved in Chinese history. And these uh, medical practitioners were uh, obviously highly psychic. And, and the system, the five element system, the acupuncture system are, are all very, very ancient. And, and not only are they ancient, but they've stood the test of time because they're still being practiced. Yeah, yeah, still being practiced. And uh, if you have illness, you can you have choice. Go to Chinese medicine hospital or Western medicine hospital. You have you have two choices. Uh, for sort of for urgent treatment, if you need operation, people normally opt for Western medicine for operation. Mm -hmm. For longer term chronic diseases, they 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 like to try Chinese medicine first. Yeah, so that you have choices. In China, you have this whole system of acupuncture meridians, which, to my knowledge, have have never been observed using any of our X-ray equipment or uh, medical scanners of different types. It's it's an intuitive system. It's an intuitive system from uh, our point of view, but for psychic people, it's a visible. It's a reality to them, actually. They can see the aura with their third eye or mind eye. They can actually see the uh, auras and see the, the qi energy flowing. Yeah. So it's not that intuitive. It, it's quite objective to them. Yeah. Because they, they can actually observe it with their third eye. The, the very idea of the third eye is, is one that has yet to be acknowledged in Western culture. But what, what you're suggesting is that in the Chinese culture, they didn't have a problem with that. Traditionally, they never have a problem. And, uh, but in recent couple of hundred years, uh, it has been treated as a superstition, actually. <laughs> so, uh, in end of, uh, 19th centuries, beginning of 20th centuries, China had a war with Britain, opium war, and China was defeated badly, and also had a war with Japan. China was also defeated at uh, the end of the uh, 19th century. And uh, so Chinese intellectuals uh, has been sort of uh, humiliated very much. So they think China traditional Chinese culture is hinder the modernization. 
Yeah. And the science and technology is the way to go. Yeah. Not the five elements, not the <laughs> qi energy. So it doesn't work in modern society. And that's for, that's why they, um, suggest to, to promote science and technology like Japan did. And uh, so they really suppress the Chinese culture, uh, very much. So the intellectuals promote science and technology, including democracy as well. <laughs> yeah. So that have been, has been a declining for the last hundred years, actually, Chinese culture. And uh, the, the bottom of declining is during the Cultural Revolution, actually. And uh, during Mao's uh, time, he uh, had the Cultural Revolution. He basically overturned everything uh, about Chinese traditional culture. Well, one of the things I understood about the Cultural Revolution, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is that they brought back some of the traditional healing practices like acupuncture became, at least it came to Western attention, I think, during the Cultural Revolution, during President Nixon's visit to China. Yes, yes, that's right. There's a limited uh, promotion, actually. Uh, acupuncture is one of the... Uh, uh, things they actually showed Nixon when he was here, when he was, uh, was in China, yeah, actually. And it, it does work, actually. It, it was used quite a lot during that time. My mom had a, a major operation on the acupuncture anesthetic, actually. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it does work. So it, it was promoted a little bit. But uh, uh, theories about the um, uh, qi energy or all sorts of things, psychic power, was never mentioned, actually. I guess so. There's sort of a, uh, a cultural confusion where they, they want to honor their traditions and at the same time they want to import Western technology. And it must have created a, a certain cognitive dissonance. So that that is true. That is true. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, but uh, in school, they only teach Marxism, Maoism, science, and technology. Nothing about sci. Nothing about the the traditional uh, uh, system, philosophy system. They they treat it as a superstition. Well, a after Mao's death, I understand, and I believe that was 1976, the, uh, things began to change. Yeah, Mao died in 1976, and uh, there's a few years confusion, uh, and uh, people don't know what to do, and there's a sort of a power turnover as well. And um, then in 1979, a child was discovered to have a power uh, to read characters uh, with his ear. Uh, the child was called Tang Yu. And a newspaper actually published uh, an article about this child. And basically, whoever can write some characters into the piece of paper, you, you can fold the paper, and he can put that paper into his ear, and he can tell what's inside. And uh, this article actually triggered a lot of interest. Yeah. And people start to, to try. And some, some adults try their children. Can you do that too? And many children are discovered that they can do also. So there's a widespread interest. And uh, you can imagine after decades of suppression, yeah, uh, you are taught what to think, what to, to see. <laughs> what to experience, and then suddenly something new. Yeah, and this triggered widespread interest in China, and lots of children over the China claim they can also do it. Yeah, and then uh, there's a lot of interest from researchers to see, oh, is this true or not? And then who can do this? And, and what else? They can do, can they do? Yeah. So this started a widespread interest and a lot of researchers get involved. And uh, in the heydays of the uh, psychic research, there's more than 100 universities in China got involved in this. 
that's way more than uh, we've had in the United States. I think even at the peak of interest in the 1970s or so, I, I very much doubt that there were programs at 100 universities. If you combine the United States and Europe together, I don't think it's ever been 100 universities. Yeah, there is also a dedicated journal to publish research papers. So there's an outlet of research results. And uh, uh, people study not only the children, they study uh, some Qigong practitioners. And um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Qigong. Uh, Qigong is kind of practice of the Qi energy. And uh, uh, to me, it's a secular form of uh, uh, Taoism. Yeah, you know, Taoism is a traditional Chinese um, practice, spiritual practice. And uh, they have a strict rules and so on. They have lineages. But for the se secular form of, of that is basically housekeeping. Yeah. And to achieve free from disease or even physical import immortality. And uh, they think that's possible by practicing qi. And uh, so it does work uh, as a healing. Yeah, instead of using healers to heal yourself, if you can practice the qi energy yourself, and you can heal yourself. And lots of people get healed. And um, so there's a widespread qigong practice as well during the 80s and 90s. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also there's a, a major proponent from the government uh, his name is Chen Xuesen, and he used to be a professor in MIT, and he was a rocket scientist. I have seen a movie about him once uh, on a United Airline international flight. Uh, I think it was produced in China. He was considered a, a great Chinese hero because he he brought rocketry to China from the United States. He he studied in the U.S., but but he was patriotic to the Chinese government and went over there and helped them develop, uh, also with help, I think, from the Russians, very large, powerful rockets. Yes, that's right. Yeah. He came back from MIT and he led the Chinese mi uh, missile program, a rocket program. And uh, so he was really keen to promote Sai research in China. And uh, he thinks he coined the term so, uh, semantic science, uh, which he defined as the combination of Chinese medicine, qigong practice, and psychic power. Yeah. So he grouped this three into a term, uh, semantic science. Mm -hmm. And he thinks semantic science is the Everest of science. And it's going to be trigger a second renaissance of humanity. Yeah. So under his leadership, uh, he, he reached a second minister level uh, in, in China uh, in, in a defense-related ministry. And he founded himself, he, he founded a research institute called 507 Research Institute. And under his leadership, he, he goes to the institute every week to talk about its science and about uh, he, he wrote, written a book as well uh, about science research about semantic science and uh, so he's really a big proponent uh, into science research in China yeah, yeah. so there's a, there's a heydays uh, uh, under his leadership. Uh, I explained to you back in 1986, I met a Chinese physicist who had come to the United States. Professor Xu was his name. He actually lived in my home for a few weeks. And he explained to me that in China, at that time, there was a young child who had the ability to take an egg in his hand and pass it right through a, an aluminum canister. And, and, and then they would open the canister, and which was sealed, and the egg would be inside of it. And his, Professor Xu's job was to make 
measurements using a device called a wire chamber, which was capable of detecting very, very high frequency signals in the micro hertz range. And, and he noticed there were spikes in the microhertz signals just as the egg was passing through the, the canister at, at that time. So, I, I gather that, uh, and I've read other stories from this era in which children could uh, impress their thoughts on on photographs. And I think they combined it with a, a clairvoyant remote viewing. They would uh, put a target inside of an envelope with some photographic film. And when the child could identify what the sealed target was, they also discovered the photographic film became fogged up. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. And there's all sorts of instruments being developed, the measurement being developed during that time by various university researchers, actually. Uh, and uh, part of the uh, work is also to detect the qi energy, measure the qi energy, which is not easy. Yeah. But a lot of efforts being spent to, to detect the qi energy. And also you, you mentioned uh, photography and they can mm -hmm. actually to transfer their image in the mind into a polarized film or, or uh, an ordinary film. Yeah. During that time. And I, gather that work began around the same time, but but there was a period in which, if I understand correctly, the parapsychology research became suppressed again after uh, sometime in the 1980s or 1990s because of the prominence of Qigong, that it was a threat to the government. That's right. That's right. And uh, during the 90s, there's a, a widespread Qigong practice. And you're talking about probably over 100 million people participating. Yeah. There's so many Qigong masters came out. And uh, they gather big crowds, big crowds and uh, of followers. Yeah. And uh, because the health benefit, and they can they can teach people to heal. They can some masters they can heal a lot of people themselves. So they attract a lot of disciples, and some of those organizations become big, become huge, and you are talking about hundreds, uh, thousands <laughs> followers, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, they become too powerful, yeah, because they have devotees. And they, whatever they say, people will listen. And uh, some of them even have uh, political ideas, and they, they, they have their own political agenda, which is not tolerated by, by the government. Yeah. yeah. So um, in 1990, uh, 1999, actually, yeah, so the qigong was was banned actually. All qigong? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, at least uh, I mean the organized qigong practice. I mean, we've all I think heard of the Falun Gong organization that was banned, but that meant all other qigong teachers who had followers were also prohibited. That that's correct. All the organized qigong practice. Uh, uh, band. And uh, in the heydays of Qigong, there's more than, more than 20 Qigong magazines even in China. They publish Qigong practice, uh, publish different wave practices of Qigong, and also include some psychic power developed through uh, Qigong practice. Yeah. Because um, when you practice Qi, uh, you actually elevate yourself above the physical and your access to a non-physical realm eventually. And once that happens, you develop a psychic power automatically. Um, so it's like a byproduct. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in a way, Qigong practice and Taoism is this kind of systematic, systematic training of obtaining acquire psychic power. Yeah. So 
th- there's uh, so many magazines also being stopped in, in 1990. Yeah. And also the, um, uh, yeah, the, the side magazine is also, uh, paranormal magazine is also being stopped. Because this was considered uh, contrary to uh, Marxist ideology, is is that why you think they they were so strongly suppressive of all these movements? It's mainly because organization, yeah, and ideology is also a part of that. Ideology conflicts as always carry on, and uh, even Mister Chen has a lot of opponents within the government. Because of ideology, yeah. Uh, but mainly the reason to ban the organized qigong practice is the organization of people, which is threatening. And it, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, uh, stories in Chinese history. Uh, the revolution are involved in. in with involvement of psychic people. Yeah. Some of the rebellions actually led by the psychic people. And, and some are assisted by psychic people. So it's, it's kind of a thre- uh, threatening actually. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it, it, it cannot be tolerated. What I gather now, that was in 1999, this major crackdown. Things have started to open up again somewhat. The science research itself was never recovered. Yeah. And uh, a lot of researchers uh, no longer carry on research. And uh, they do that other subject. Um, part of that is, is also funding. Yeah. There has never been funding. People do research purely driven by their interest, personal interest. Mm-hmm. There never been any funding apart from the 507 Institute, which is government funding organized by, uh, by Qian. Uh, but other universities, they, they were probably given time to do it, mm-hmm. but there's never funding. So when you say a hundred universities back in the 1970s, most of that was without funding. Without funding, without funding. probably that time is, is covered. Yeah, they are allowed to spend some time to do it, but there's, a, there's a never a proper funding for them. Yeah, it's, it's purely driven by curiosity and interest. Well, that, that would be comparable to the United States and Western Europe as well, that the people who are in universities who have a personal interest, they would join the Society for Psychical Research or the Parapsychological Association and take a great interest in the field and conduct research on using their own funds to, to do it and, and sometimes publish. I think that's a, about the same as in this country. Most of the research are physicists, uh, actually. Yeah. And uh, I can't recall any psychologist involved in this. And, and even, yeah, they don't even have a parapsychology uh, subject as a discipline. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's normally, uh, physicists and chemists and mm-hmm. engineers, they, they, they are driven by their curiosity to do this kind of research. You were vice president of the Chinese Parapsychology Association. Can you talk about that organization and its standing? After 1999, and there, there hasn't been a lot of interest uh, in, in science research uh, in, in China. And uh, so there is only, I would say, a couple of dozen people still doing researchers. And most of them actually retired. And they prefer, they they, 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 they chosen to spend that retirement time to do science research. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they have a pension, and they, they don't have uh, any any other duties, and uh, so those kind of people carry on. But younger researchers, they they no longer doing it. Yeah, so there's only um, probably two dozen researchers carries on, and uh, many of them are in their seventies and eighties now. Yeah, 
And I actually um, got involved in this uh, actually in early uh, 2000, actually. So at that time, there's already heyday is gone. Yeah, as, as only a few research they, they carry on. And uh, so that's the time I actually I joined, uh, I got involved. Yeah. So c- can I tell you the, the reason I got involved in this? Yes. Do I have an opportunity to tell? Yeah. Of course. Yes. So in early 2000, I uh, have my uh, wisdom tools started to play out. And uh, I was traveling in China on business. It became so painful. And I went to hospital and they, they suggest it's, it's quite complicated. Uh, you, you need a general anesthetic. I thought, oh, this is big. So at that time, one of my friends told me that uh, this, oh, why don't you go to this place? Uh, I said, what, what place? He said, oh, he's doing a fantastic job uh, to, to take teeth out of people. So I went. And it's a small place uh, in suburb of Beijing. And uh, when I went there, I saw people actually popping the teeth out uh, from their mouths. Yeah. And also on the wall of the, the, the clinic, there's so many pictures of celebrities and officials and uh, even the... Um, Member of Chinese Communist Party, uh, Politburo, went there to have their tools taken out. Oh, I thought, oh, this is encouraging. So he's meaning his business. And uh, what he did is actually just use his tweezers to take, to take my <laughs> tools. Actually, he, he, he took two of my, the, the other one is not painful. He said uh, it might cause him problem later on. He took both of my wisdom tools out at the time. <clears throat> Not much pain and, and no uh, anesthetic, no uh, blood clotting injection. And uh, I felt a bit of uncomfortable, but nothing very painful. And uh, then we went to lunch together. And uh, so I, I become really curious. Uh, I said, uh, I asked him during lunch, what actually happened? What the hell? Did you do to me? And he said, um, I have a incantation. Is that right? What incantation? Or mantra? Yeah, yeah, a, a mantra. And uh, he said, I have a five syllable incantation. And uh, that's what I use to take people's tooth out. <laughs> so I become really curious. I become really curious. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I have always been a very curious person from very childhood. I've always been curious. And, uh, in my childhood, my favorite book is a Chinese book called A Hundred Thousand Whys. It's a popular science book. Ask why. It's, it's <laughs> a hundred thousand whys. That was my favorite book. So I have a lot of curiosity to ask why this happens. And this puzzled me for many years. And uh, this is the start of my journey into parapsychology and paranormal research. Mm. Yeah. So from that point, I start to look for other phenomena. Yeah. So um, at the time, I my, my work bring myself to China regularly. So I spend a fair bit of time in China. And uh, so of my duty, of my day job, almost all my time is spent to look for weird people. Yeah, look for weird phenomena. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, it has been a very fascinating journey for me, actually. And uh, of course, I got involved as well in the research side. But the majority of my time is actually spent on uh, field research. Yeah. Looking for those people and see what they can do. Yeah. What can fascinate me. Yeah. So, um, it is so diverse. What I discovered is the paranormal is so diverse. The phenomena is so diverse. Yeah. Normally we classify Psi as, um, ESP or uh, 
uh, PK as two mm-hmm. big categories. I, I don't think that's that's enough. You, you need a different classification because you cover different phenomena. And uh, I actually discovered, uh, developed my own classification alongside the, the two main categories. Yeah, I classified uh, uh, the paranormal phenomena I discovered, I experienced as a, as a physical, a chemical, biological, energetic, and informational. Do I have opportunity to uh, talk a bit uh, some of these ex- examples I have encountered? I know you have many examples, and, and of course, we want to get into some of your theoretical work, but I'd like to talk about Sun Chu Lin and, and the people who have been researching her, because she seems like an extraordinary psychic talent who has had a, a major influence and still does today, for all I know. That's correct. Uh, Sun Chu Lin is one of the stars of Psy research. Uh, in China, um, there, there, there's a few stars, and uh, she's one of those stars. And because she's so cooperative, yeah, and um, she actually discovered herself uh, has a psi ability from very child, very, very young age, like five years old. And uh, and uh, when she was discovered by the researchers, she was working in the university library as a librarian. Yeah, one of the research is a geochemist, and his name is uh, Shen Jingchuan. And he was already quite established uh, in his field. Uh, he published papers in Nature. He discovered some uh, crystal structure of minerals, and he got involved in Sai research. And they, they both of them teamed together. And um, so they both of them work together probably for more than 15 years. They produced some fantastic results. And because he's a professional researcher, a scientist, and he knows about control, about how, how to do experiment properly. And so lots of his experiments are actually, um, is quite well controlled, uh, well uh, well reputable uh, research results. And uh, Sun Chu Lin actually, during that time, she developed a lot of new abilities during his career uh, as a Psy uh, subject, uh, working uh, with uh, Professor Shen. Yeah. And uh, lots of things uh, he can uh, do. Uh, in, in terms of paranormal uh, side of things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for example, interaction with the biosystem. Uh, the, the seeds, she can make it germinate in 10 minutes. Yeah. Put in her hands, and, and the seeds can germinate. And uh, also, green apple, yeah, can ripe into the red apple in her hand. So that, that, that's, uh, uh, he, he does it routinely. And uh, as a lot of psychokinesis work he can do. And uh, he can turn the blade of the um, radiometer. Radiometer was invented by William, uh, William Crookes. Yeah, mm-hmm. our past president of SPI in, in the UK. And it's, it's a vacuum cube with the blades inside, which turns when you shine the light onto it. And uh, soon can actually turn it backwards uh, by her mind. Yeah, if you can concentrate the mind, she can turn the blades backwards, which is not possible uh, according to physics. When, when did the research with her begin? Mid-80s. In the mid-80s. And, and it's in spite of the suppression, she is still active. After 1999, I mean, I don't think uh, Professor Shen uh, was doing any more after the, the crackdown uh, in 1999. But uh, Sun has been involved uh, in some training of kids and uh, to do all sorts of things, including 
uh, materialization of herbal medicine. Yeah, mm -hmm. so materialization of herbal medicine is one of her uh, favorite tricks. <laughs> Well, now there's an interesting confluence of psychokinetic ability of some sort, or perhaps spiritualistic powers, with ancient Chinese culture. Yeah, she 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 has been able to do uh, um, materialization of uh, Chinese herbal medicine, and that herbal medicine can be used to treat patients. Uh, so that medicine was produced for the patients in front of her. Yeah, from from nowhere, from nowhere. Yeah, so that that's that's quite impressive. Yeah, of course the the, the normal things like metal bendings and so on, uh, that's easy for her. <clears throat> she can pass solid objects through a solid wall. Yeah, and to another container. Yeah, there's a lot of controlled experiment done on that one as well. And psychic photography. Yeah. Photography, yeah. She was the first in China actually performed photography, yeah. Together with uh, Professor Shen, they produced uh, hundreds of photographic uh, um, uh, photos, yeah. Typically at that, that time in the 80s and 90s, they produced the, uh, they used the polarized film. Actually, without camera, yeah. Initially, she can just place her hand onto the uh, film and transfer her uh, mind image onto the film. Yeah. So whatever she can produce, she can visualize in her mind vision, she can bring that vision onto the film. Yeah. So there's hundreds of different uh, photos <laughs> with different things uh, which she perceives in her vision. Well, I think the amazing thing that I've heard from your earlier report is that she has been accepted into the educational system and uh, the different schools in China work with her to teach young children to do this. That is true. That is true. Um, uh, so I mentioned this, this diminishing uh, research efforts compared with the heydays. There's still a few, yeah, I mean, a dozen uh, researchers doing this. Um, end of the uh, 90s, yeah. <clears throat> At the same time, beginning of 2000, early 2000, there's increasing number of training facilities start to build up. Yeah, you have one side declining of the research side, and uh, the other side is increasing of the training, uh, yeah, especially for the ESP training. Like yin and yang. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So it's a lot of uh, research results uh, from the research community has been transferred into the training community. There's, a, there's two communities, yeah. So they, 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 they don't always work together. But a lot of training method developed during the 80s, 90s by the research community. It's like a technology transfer. They are transferred into the training facility. <clears throat> so it's, it has become a kind of commercial activity for, for training. Yeah. So since early 2000s, there has been steady increasing of ESP training for young school children in China. And many parents uh, send their children for those training facilities as, as extracurricular activity. Yeah. As a means to help their kids to do better in school. Yeah. So you're talking about at the moment, I think you're talking about at least 10,000, 10,000 schools. 10,000 schools. 10,000 schools. That's impressive. And each school must have many, many children. Yeah, that's right. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of children going through this. Yeah. And uh, some has become quite big, actually, school. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the school, uh, they, they got closed down a couple of years ago. They have 
more than 300 franchise. So it's a, it's a big operation, actually. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of children go through this. Yeah, it, it's ironic, actually, uh, because in, in, in mainstream media, they're still talking about this is a fake. Yeah, this is not mm-hmm. possible. Yeah, according to science, this is not possible. Yeah, in, even in TV program, they, they have experts, the scientists, neuroscientists, they're talking about how the vision works and how the light photon get into the retina and produce images. And uh, so therefore, this is not possible. Uh, this must be fake. Yeah. Despite a lot of those kind of propaganda, uh, um, so-called popular science, uh, there's still so many parents send their children through into this kind of activity schools. And I, I gather you've witnessed it firsthand. Yeah, yeah. And the part of the time is actually working with children and working, um, see how they do. And uh, it does act- actually help them to do uh, their schoolwork. Yeah. So they are trained to have uh, um, mind vision. Yeah. And uh, they can use the mind vision as information storage device. Yeah. So they can store the photograph of each page of the book. Yeah. So then they have different stages of the training. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have an opportunity to describe yes. what kind of yes. stages? Yeah. Um, they normally start with the uh, uh, color of the cards. Yeah. You have different color of cards and you blind. Uh, blindfold the children, ask them to, to see which card is which color. So gradually they develop a color into their vision. And then they can see uh, the card itself without the physical eye. And the next stage is, is uh, uh, write the character, write the symbols in piece of paper. Uh, again, blindfold and they can recognize the, the, they can get the information, they can get image of the character. Yeah. So the next stage is, is to photographic memory. They can photograph whatever appeared in their vision and the store there. Yeah. So they can photograph each page of the book. Initially, they can look at the, the book and they, they can photograph page into the book, they can retrieve this page. Yeah, whenever they want to. Yeah. Then the next stage is actually they, they don't even need to spend time to photograph. They can just uh, flip flip the book like that. All the pages will be in their mind vision. Yeah, if you ask me uh, can you tell me what the page, uh, uh, page 500, for example, what's on the f- page 500? They can tell you. They can read it backwards. So it's, it's not, it's not memory. It's a photography. Yeah. It's, it's image of the, all the, the pages. They can retrieve. Yeah. So the next stage is actually they don't have to even open a book. Yeah, they can do that remotely. Some, some kids, advanced uh, children, they can actually uh, uh, retrieve a content of book from a library, mm, which they don't possess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so next stage is actually to access a non-physical teacher, a non-physical tutor, for example. Whatever skills you want to learn, you can create a tutor in your mind vision. You can interact with that tutor. And that tutor can, can tutor you whatever subject you want. Yeah. For example, if you want to sort of improve that piano lesson, uh, you can get Chopin to come to teach you, to correct you. Yeah. 
and yeah, yeah, sports. If you want to sort of improve your golf playing, for example, you can get Tiger Woods to come. Yeah, so it's not only the dead people. You can access a non-physical version of living people. And if they want to learn parapsychology, for example, they can get a non-physical Jeffrey Mishlov to teach them. And that non-physical Jeff is much more intelligent. Yeah, much more wise. They, they know what the children needs to do. They know the level of the children. Yeah. So that's advanced stage. And also they can create more time at that mind vision. It's another world. Yeah. That world have a different clock. So they can create, for example, in, in the physical level of the universe, you have one hour in the, a different level of that non-physical world, you can have eight hours. So they have a lot more time to learn. It's all very impressive. And, and I guess it also entails projecting their mental images onto uh, both Polaroid film, and I think you've mentioned onto the uh, memory of an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a new thing, uh, because nowadays <coughs> everybody have, have, a, have a cell phone. And uh, some of the, the kids uh, are able to bring their mind, vision, mind, image into the memory card, into the photographic gallery of your cell phone. Yeah, this is quite exciting also. Do they need to press the shutter in order to take a picture, or is it done strictly mentally? There's more than one way to do it. Actually, yeah, and some can just go straight into the gallery. Some needs to bring their mobile phone, a mental version, their physical mobile phone, into their the mental vision and press the the shutter, press the shutter of the non physical cell phone. Mm -hmm. That seems to be there is a sort of entanglement between the non physical version and the physical version. Once you operate the non physical version of the cell phone, the physical version of the cell phone has it also. Yeah, it's, it's quite a strange phenomena. Yeah, I, I'm looking into this seriously at the moment. Yeah. Another thing they can do is they, they can do complex mathematical problems by accessing a mental, non-physical calculator. Yeah, if you're giving, if they're giving a, a complex math problem, they can just key in the math problem in their mind vision, uh, in that non-physical calculator, then they get answer. They can just read all the answer. If all of this is true, it would suggest to me that a widespread training of this sort in China would mean that the Chinese will uh, very shortly excel in, in many areas, whereas Western education seems to be falling uh, behind in regard. You, you think if there was a sort of a psi war going on, it would become necessary for Western countries to begin uh, similar training. Yes, I, actually, I discovered there are also Western schools also uh, in, in Europe. Uh, that, that there's also a school called the Sea Without Ice. Uh, they, 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 train also, they, they also train people. I have heard of that, yes. So in some isolated uh, locations, I think even in Eastern Europe, but uh, not widespread as you seem to be describing in China. Yeah, China has a big population, so there's a lot of people going through. Even it's a still a very small percentage of people. You're talking about large numbers. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. And uh, mm -hmm. so you, on one side, you have a, a declining research. The other side is, 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 is a training, is industrialization of the science. 
ESP phenomena. So in a way, it's, it's proving it's valid. I mean, there's so many parents, they, they are buying it. They're paying a lot of money, actually. Yeah, so the, those courses are not cheap. They're paying a lot of money. There's so many parents come through and then they stay so many years. That actually gave me a lot of confidence. There's something in mm-hmm. this. Yeah. Although the research effort never actually proved scientifically this. Yeah. yeah. So that's another thing. That that's why it's diminishing because that's another reason because uh, as a lot of a formal validation has failed, mm-hmm. yeah, in, in China. So uh, I think it's actually similar. It's, it's never been proven scientifically. Well, you'd think it would be a huge research opportunity. It is huge research opportunity, but I also realize the difficulties in research. Mm-hmm. This, yeah, yeah. and. Uh, a lot of efforts in the research community in China has been trying to prove it. Yeah. And they all failed. I, I see. So there have been research efforts. There has been research efforts uh, before the training. I mean, the, the training community, they are not interested in research. They, they just <laughs> interested in uh, keep their customer satisfied and keep yeah. uh, parents happy. That's all they, they, they need to do. Whereas the research community, they have been trying to um, prove it, even in high days in 80s and 90s. And uh, they've never been proven. Except you've talked about Sun Chu Lin, who seems to be a bridge between these two worlds, who, who was researched. Yes, yes, that's again. It's a, it's a researched um, in a sort of a isolated place. Yeah, mm-hmm. in the lab of uh, Professor Shen, and uh, she couldn't do it sometimes in a formal mm-hmm. setting in a scientific lab. Yeah, and uh, also a lot of psychics uh, are even. Worse than that, they, they, they were found to be um, doing tricks, doing magic tricks. So there's a major setbacks, yeah, uh, in, in the research community uh, before the end of 1999. Uh, there's, there's several major efforts. For example, the children. Children has always been heavily involved in research because the researchers uh, find training children is not difficult. Yeah, uh, there has been organized efforts uh, to prove, for example, ESP. Yeah, and they have a level of selections from city level into the uh, province level, then into the country level, where they set up the formal testing. Yeah, uh, with the uh, Chinese Academy of Science stuff. Yeah. Uh, some s- s- skeptics people also. Mm-hmm. And uh, in that final stage, they all fail. They, they, they can't do it. Yeah. Or even worse, they are found cheating. They were found cheating. So um, it, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. But I gather from your own observations, you're inclined to think that Whatever is going on is not all fake, that something real is taking place. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, although it cannot be re- reproduced on demand. And uh, some people can't accept this. A lot of research are disillusioned uh, because they had setbacks, uh, particularly if they found uh, people are cheating. They can't accept that. But to me, I think you can't really throw the, the baby with bathwater. Yeah, there's a mixture of things in this. Yeah. Um, I actually think there's a deeper reasons why this fail. Yeah. Um, do I have an opportunity to... Uh... Yes, yes, let's... Please. I think the society at the large is not ready for this. 
Yeah. And uh, even with existing technology, we already made the world really messy. Yeah, we have nuclear power, we have nuclear bombs at the same time. And uh, uh, psychic power is even more powerful. And uh, it, it can make the society really mess, out of order. Yeah, so I, I think there's intelligence involved in output results. I think most people are not ready. They, sh- they are actually designed to witness this is not working. I agree with you, actually. I think there are, are sociological factors at the parapsychological level that suppress the phenomenon be- for, for deep psychological reasons. Yeah, also society reasons. Yeah. I mean, the society needs to be stable. I mean, this is a game. This, uh, this is a game. They, they, they have a set of rules. Yeah. And that rules keep the society, keep the, uh, the nature in operation, in order. Yeah. If you disturb it, okay, you can disturb it locally, temporarily. But you shouldn't disturb it too much. Otherwise, it's out of order. The consequences may not be good. Yeah. I, I think this is only for small minority people to research, to witness, to understand, not for large. Well, I tend to agree with you, Simon. Uh, but before we close our interview, I want to give you an opportunity. You brought up uh, a few things related to your theoretical model and your different categories of uh, psychic experience that you, you wanted to go over. So let's take some time for that as well. So during my involvement uh, with paranormal research, it's been a journal of bewilderment. Yeah, and also fascination at the same time. Yeah, because you, you see so many phenomena to start with the, the tooth removal. And it puzzled me for many years how this can happen. Yeah, from the uh, accepted scientific discipline, it, it, it cannot be explained. And uh, plus more and more phenomena I have seen. Yeah. Uh, I have a witness because I spent so many, so, so much time, uh, to, to see those people and even to stay them, stay with them in, in, in their house for a few days. <laughs> uh, so I become more and more puzzled. I need the answer. How come this can happen? Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's good fun, actually. Yeah. Like, like the, um, teleportation. Yeah. I, I experience a, a fun game of teleportation. Um, he actually make a living by betting with people. Yeah. Uh, so he's got a tortoise, tortoise, and the game is to, you, you race with the tortoise. Yeah. See, who get the destination first? It's probably a hundred meters away in, in, in the ground. Yeah. And you, you start the same line with the tortoise. And you, you sign your name on a sticker, you stick onto the tortoise. Yeah. A tortoise, the animal. Yeah. Tortoise. And you start to race, like Achilles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you, you're like Achilles. Yeah, there's a, a mm-hmm. tortoise and with your name and sticker. And uh, you start to walk. Of course, gradually, you can see he's still behind. Yeah. Yeah. You're further away. Now you reach the destination. You find the tortoise is already there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Already in the destination with your signature, with the sticker on his back. Oh. Yeah. It so- sounds like a magic trick. Uh, many things that sounds like a magic trick, but some some things cannot be tricked. Actually, yeah, and uh, it's it's like a, 
some psychics they they can change the property of material. Uh, um, if you drink with them, uh, one of the psychic, um, when we drink, we drink alcohol. We say gambe, we can means everything finished. Yeah, uh, you mm-hmm. empty uh, the wine glasses. Yeah, he said, "Oh, this is not empty glasses." Yeah. You need to eat the glasses as well. Yeah, that, that's what he does. He drinks the uh, wine and he eats the glasses as well, wine glass. Oh? Yeah, so he said, this is real Finnish. He <laughs> 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 just threw this like a, mm. like a, uh, like a crisps. I think they make wine glasses that are edible, but I think I gather you're talking about a real glass wine glass. You're you're talking about something that most people will refuse to believe, something that we call high strangeness, which I'm pretty familiar with high strangeness and I understand it goes on, but as you point out earlier, most people are not prepared to accept it. No, no. You can bring your own glasses, and you can bring nails. You can sometimes bring the razor blades. He can eat them. Yeah. I asked me, uh, how can you eat those? He actually told me, oh, you, as long as you don't see this as a razor blade. Yeah. That's quite profound. Yeah. Then I, I, I realized something. Yeah. In his... In his world, this is not a blade. This is something else. Yeah. So they live in a different reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is this. Uh, I learned a lot from interacting with, with those people, and uh, also some controlled experiment, like, like teleportation. Again, there's a, there's a gentleman. He also makes a living by doing this, and every time uh, we use him. He has to bring some money back to his wife. That's how he are uh, allowed to go out. We, we brought him to a proper lab uh, in Beijing and we stripped him out, stripped everything out, including the underwear, and, and locked him in a room. Yeah, this is a, uh, I mean, it's a, as good control as we can do. And he can teleport some money. Yeah, some banknotes <laughs> into the room. Into the room where he is. Into the room where mm-hmm. he is. So he can bring it home to his wife. Uh, well, we have to pay him. Yeah, he yeah. said the money he he, tra- he teleport cannot be used. Mm. Yeah, and in a few days it will disappear again. So, uh, according to him. Yeah, mm-hmm. we actually did some controlled experiment. We asked him to teleport GPS. Nowadays, GPS is quite cheap. Yeah, yeah. and uh, he can make it disappear, and we we can track it, track the <laughs> track where it is. Yeah, can be hundreds oh. hundreds of miles away. I, I know you probably have many more stories, and I would love. To, I want to bring you back so we can talk much more because it's important to let our viewers know that you actually have developed a theoretical model that's consistent with contemporary, what can I say, leading edge thought that might explain this kind of phenomenon that is otherwise completely unbelievable. Yes. Yeah. Um... Before I get to this, uh, uh, can I mention one more thing? Of course. I think this is worth mentioning because this is a unique piece of work. It's to do with UFO encounter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's, there's so many UFO encounters. Even in, in history, even in ancient time, they already have records of UFO yes. uh, encounters. But this person... I visited him um, in early 2000. He actually spent 23 days, uh, 23 years to communicate with aliens. And uh, he had written uh, lots of notes. A small percentage of that notes has been published as a book 
to describe different alien planets. Yeah. And uh, there's, at the moment, there's a set of books published um, which describe in detail on 55 alien planets with all the details. Yeah, every planet is, is, is different. They have different cosmology and uh, some has four seasons, some have three seasons. Some orbits like a, like a figure of eight. Some like a perfect circle, and they have different geography, and different vegetation, different housing. Some housings are made by crystals, and uh, different looks, of course. Yeah, they have all sorts of looks. But from these fifty-three planets, people, um, I think only one or two are look like human. Most of them are so admiring. The Earth human, because we are so beautiful. Yeah, most of them are, are more ugly than us. Yeah, mm. of course they have different lives, different society, and different uh, culture. And uh, some society are democracy, some are dictatorship, and some leaders are elected. Some are generated by computer. Computer decide who is going to be the next leader. Yeah, a, a different food, different transportation. It's so diverse. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's it's very systematic in details. All the different planets. Yeah, and different clock in those planets. Uh, so this actually um, also inspired me to develop my own theory. Uh, in, in my theory. The cosmos is a multiverse, yeah, and all the parallel universes are pro product of computation. So th 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 there's a <laughs> transcendental computer, yeah. It's not a physical; it's a transcendental computer, uh, which operating at a different clock. At each different clock speed, it produces a reality, a virtual reality. Okay. The physical universe is only one of many parallel universes. Yeah. And each parallel universe are operating at a different clock speed. And therefore, they have different vibration frequency. Yeah. By tuning into different vibration frequency, this is what the uh, the UFO encounter people uh, he, he told me he need to tune into different vibration frequency, then he can communicate with that level of being. Yeah, so it's a multiverse produced by computer operating at a different clock speed, and our universe is a physical because we have a set of rules which produce physics. And other universes, they don't necessarily have a same set of rules. And they don't necessarily have the same data set. That's why there's so much diversity in the universe. Yeah. At a different level. And even in the same level in different world. It's like a different game. Yeah. You play a different game into different, in a different environment. Uh, you follow different rule sets. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know there's a lot of serious thinkers who talk about the simulation hypothesis. Nick Bostrom, for example, uh, I think he's an Oxford or Cambridge philosopher, has uh, written about this uh, very seriously in the academic literature. And uh, I've done several interviews on the simulation hypothesis. I think the uniqueness of your particular approach is, you called it a transcendental computer. I think in other words, you've described it as a platonic computer. It is, yeah. I call it a platonic computer. Uh, because transcendental computer is, is a bit of a vague, and uh, also it's too spiritual, too new agey. And uh, so, if it's not a physical computer, where can I locate it? 
Yeah, it's definitely not a physical computer uh, because the space itself and the, sp- the contents within the space are a producing uh, a processing output of a computation. Therefore, the computer itself cannot be in a space. It has to be outside the space. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I think it has to be transcendental. But if it's a transcendental, you don't know where it is. Uh, luckily, Plato already have a systematic approach into these problems, and uh, he, he call it a realm of forms. Yeah, where the ab- abstract entities exist, like numbers, mm-hmm. like perfect geometry shapes, like abstract concepts. And that's the place I located this computer, and I call it platonic computer. Therefore, there's a philosophical uh, backing, <laughs> a philosophical grounding in my system. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the platonic computer is, is transcendental, it's non-physical, uh, but it's more real. That's the reality. Mm-hmm. The reality is, is the data, it's the bits, it's the information. Uh, so computation, you produce this virtual reality, and uh, this virtual reality feels real, feels physical, because it has a rule set, it's called physics. Yeah. All the universe are equally real, like a dream world, like a uh, psychedelic world, like near-death experience world. They are all real. Some experiences are even experience. They, they say this more real than this physical reality. <laughs> that makes sense to me, because nowadays, we are actually building another parallel universe, which we call it the metaverse, which is virtual reality world. So basically, you uh, wear a goggle of virtual reality, and you experience virtual reality. You no longer experience this reality. Yeah. So that's another reality, another parallel universe we produce. If you push this back. We, our physical eyes, are also a pair of goggles. If you take this physical goggle out, you experience another level of reality, which is the third eye reality. Yeah. So there's a layers. Our, our self is actually like a stacking Russian door. We have layers. And at the moment, we are adding another layer, which is virtual reality by the, by the goggles. Yeah. Mm. But we have many layers, and each layer realer than the previous layer. So that, that's my theory. Well, Simon, this has been a wonderful discussion. We've covered so much ground uh, from ancient history to modern computer simulation theory. Uh, I'm delighted to have had this conversation with you. And as we've discussed, I'd love to have you come back so we can explore both your theories in more depth and also more of your experiences with uh, these remarkable people in China whom you've met. Oh, yeah, I'd love to, yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me again. I'm sure we'll have a a good time again. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, Simon. Thank you for having me again. Thank you. And for those of you who are watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Thank you.